Now you are, so I get it on tape, Eileen Yoshiko Okada. And where were you born? Seattle. Seattle. Mm -hmm. And what did your parents do? Uh, my dad worked um, for a wholesale fish company, uh, Maine Fish it was at that time. My mom was a homemaker. And, and brothers and sisters? Or? I'm the oldest of five. Ah, you're that responsible yeah. oldest. Uh. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. But when we were evacuated, um, there were four of us. So who, who oh, the, the, the... And then my, the youngest was born in camp. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, huh, I wonder, how, how did that all go, having a child in camp and... I remember when, she, they, when they brought her home. Yeah. Was there a hospital in the camp? Or did I you... think so. Yes, well, yes, there was. Yeah. So which, now which camp did you end up at? We went to uh, Minidoka in Idaho. Beautiful Idaho. <laughs> I hear the winters it's, were wonderful. Oh, yeah. I don't remember a lot, but it's beautiful now because we've been back to um, Minidoka to hunt Idaho. and It's green, and it isn't anything like I remember it. And is, now is the camp totally gone? Gone. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I've heard there's a couple of places that, I think one of the ones in California where if you go and even ask about it, that they kind of say, uh, Oh, really? Was never here. Oh. Yeah. They, we don't know anything about it. We and, went to uh, Manzanar a couple, couple years ago um, and drove through. It's, it's still, they don't have the barracks anymore, but they have a lot of the, buildings and the press building, free press was it called, <laughs> their camp newspaper and, and it's still the buildings and in. it has names of what was there, you know, and yeah, so, but nothing, Hunt wasn't like that. They have the uh, waiting room there and the guard tower, I think, one guard tower was there, but administration offices maybe, but they're it's a very small area. Do, do you remember leaving Seattle and how that all happened? No, my first recollection was Puyallup. I was um, five, I had just turned five. And I remember going to Puyallup. Um, I don't remember getting there. But my first recollection was Puyallup, and I remember um, the smell of the horses. I think it was horses, but animal smells. I, I remember that, and I remember walking up and down the gangplank um, to see different families that were there, too. So families that you had known? Yeah, my cousins. I think my cousins were also taken there. Somebody, I must have known some people because I remember going up and down the gangplank and they were wooden boards and walking and seeing people. So, do, do, so when, when you close your eyes, can you visualize what the, because now, you know, you see it and there's a Mm -hmm. roller coaster there mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. But do you remember what it looked like? Yeah, kind of. I remember the door, you know, and it's just a kind of a narrow stall, and I remember the door. Um, I seem to recollect some wire, you know, like mesh kind of wire or something. I don't know, but I remember that. I also remember uh, another reason why I remember Puyallup is I got chicken pox in camp, and um, they uh, took me away from the family. And I, when I think back, it's probably because of the um, highly contagious nature of the, of the sickness, although when my children got chicken pox, I couldn't imagine them taking my kids away, you know. Um, but, um, and because I was young, um, one of my grandmas went with me, and they took me away to, they put me in the uh, medical ward, into the hospital or someplace, 
And I remember staying there with my grandma for, um, I don't know how long. And um, I remember um, it was really traumatic for me because I remember crying a lot. But that's another reason why I remember Puyallup. I, can, I mean, I can only imagine, first of all, here you are, this little girl, and they've taken you and put you in a whole new environment, mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. we're taking you away from mm -hmm. your family. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, and I can only imagine what the medical ward was like. Yeah, and I, I, I can imagine what my mom, <laughs> you know. And then I remember my brother getting it. After I came back, I remember my brother getting it, and he, <clears throat> my other grandma taking it, going <laughs> with it. Wow. Huh. I can't remember, because Puyallup had a, and I can't remember the name of it now, but they gave Camp it. Camp Harmony. That's right, Camp Harmony. One of, that's a happy one, yeah. you know, again, here's the war of words. <laughs> Camp, Camp Harmony, yeah. you're going to, you know. I don't is, know who named it that, but. Well, I'm yeah. sure it was very well mm -hmm. thought out, and, mm -hmm. and uh, huh. So, that, Camp Harmony was used kind of as a clearing house, or were there a lot of people that stayed there? No, I think it was a temporary, it was a holding area, because um, the camp at Minidoka wasn't ready. They hadn't built it yet, and it was being built, and so they took us, we went in April, I think it was April, April or May, early in the spring we went and were taken to Puyallup. And I think it was in August. We were there for three or four months. I think it was in August they took us to Idaho. And do you, do you remember getting there, moving there, or do you just remember arriving? I just remember, I don't, I don't remember, I know we went on the train, my mom told me, but I don't remember the train ride you know, at all. Do you remember, I, I, I know you could only take, what was it, what, what you could carry mm -hmm. or a few items. Mm -hmm. Do you remember any of what you had, what you took with you? Mm-mm. Mm -mm. I don't think I had a, you know, a favorite toy or anything or an animal. I just know that my mom said, I mean, we were, I was five and there were four or three underneath me. So, there were a lot of things that they had taken my mom saying um, they couldn't have done it without my grandparents because I'm sure they helped carry a lot of things because my, the youngest, the fourth child was still a babe in arms because she was born in October of 41. So she must have been like six months or six or seven months. So she was, you know, they had to carry her plus I mean, you know all the stuff you need for babies <laughs> and themselves, and so I just, yeah. Wow, and that was before disposable diapers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Boy, so uh, both sets of grandparents? Or? Both sets of grandparents. So the whole clan was, mm -hmm. huh. Mm -hmm. As a five-year-old, you're really too young probably to remember the demeanor of your parents and things like that, mm -hmm. and for you, You'd only had five years of life, so it was, I guess, normal to a certain extent, I would assume. Or do you remember being afraid of? No. Mm -mm. I don't. And, you know, looking back, I think I always thought I had a pretty normal childhood. But then when I think, well, a lot of my friends weren't in a camp you know, in their childhood. But um, a lot of people I know were in camps because of my friends and my cousins, and we were all there. So that's what made it seem normal to me. But then as I grew up um, and went to high school and college and we talked about childhood, you know, not camp wasn't a normal part of their childhood. <laughs> Yeah, they all, they all were talking about summer camp. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking about camps with guns. Yeah. You know, yeah, that's not an yeah. average uh -huh. experience. Mm -hmm. for, that's interesting because I never thought about that. So after leaving the camp, then, then going to high school and things like that, uh, did you ever 
get, it sounds like you did get in conversations with people that... Things might. that we remember or did when we were kids, you know, and we never... <clears throat> I don't... Yeah, I, They tried to keep it as normal as... I know my parents tried to keep things as normal as possible, you know. I mean, I started kindergarten in camp. Um, we went to church. Um, my parent, my mom was a Catholic. So we went to, I remember walking blocks to church, but we went to church. I made my first communion in camp. Um, so, you know, and my, um, my cousins were in the same barrack as we were, but they were on the other end because they had a big family and we had a big family, so we had the two end units. Um, so I remember playing with them. You know, my, my dad's parents were in the same block as we were, but on the other side. So I remember walking over there to see my... And then my mom's parents were in the next block. So we were block 16, and my mother's parents were block 17. So I remember walking over to see them. It, it's, it's, it's interesting because as you describe things, again, I keep trying to visualize this. You know, uh, when you talk about, quote, average life, child growing up, their bedroom, their brother's mm -hmm. bedroom, their, one room. Yeah, but we had, my dad built a partition, so I, know, I remember their bedroom, and then we had our, quote, bedroom. And um, I don't know how we got it, but I remember a double bunk. And my brother and I slept on the top because we were the older ones. And my other brother and sister sleeping on the bottom. And then when my baby sister was born, she was in a bassinet in my folks' side, you know. <clears throat> and was just, I, maybe it was just a curtain, just a kind of a curtain or something. Yeah. But no, we didn't have our own, we didn't have rooms or bedrooms or anything. We didn't even have a bathroom. I mean, we had a potty. And there was, I assume, a, um, like a shower house or, mm -hmm. so you would have to go. My mom had to, I remember her carrying the potty every day to the bathrooms to empty it and wash it out because we were little, so if we got up during the night, we were too little to walk to the bathroom, so we just went in on the potty. <clears throat> and I remember her doing that. I remember her going with her to help her in the laundry room to do the wash because we had a lot of diapers. And, uh, yeah, I remember the mess hall where we went to eat. Do, do, do you remember any of the meals? Did you have a favorite meal or a least favorite meal? Mm -hmm. or mm -mm. It just was food. Mm -hmm. I remember, I know my mother said um, we had a lot of tongue. And um, the first time, <laughs> or not the first time, but once when we had tongue, and I don't, we even remember eating tongue, but um, my brother asked, what is this, you know, and, and she tried to discreetly tell him it was tongue, and she said, it's tongue, and he said, whose tongue? <laughs> and then she said everybody on, that, on our table, you know, didn't want to eat it. <laughs> yeah, that would, that would do it. <laughs> but she said we had a lot of tongue. But I don't remember much of the food. Do you remember, did, did your dad have to work then in mm -hmm. the... Mm -hmm. My dad um, was a recreation director. And um, I remember kids, he, he um, had the key to the gym. And so I remember um, kids coming over all the time asking him for the key to the gym or for an equipment, you know, a piece of equipment. And so, and I don't even know where the gym was, but I just, 
You remember him asking for the key? Yeah, right. Because I said, again, that's hard having not been there, getting that perspective that this is a, a small town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's not, you think uh, when you see pictures, they go, oh, everything's just right here, everybody knows everybody, but it's a mm -hmm. town. Mm -hmm. huh. I don't remember the store. I don't remember a store. I remember kind of like a canteen. Um, but I don't remember a store, but I remember school and I remember church. So, um, sweets, candies, uh, running down the store, you know, they always mm -hmm. talk about the nickel candies. I don't remember that. Yeah. Huh. Holidays? Birthday? I remember one Christmas, um, I saw my dad um, building something. I don't know where he got the materials or anything, but he was making um, a cupboard. And um, I asked him what it was, and he said, oh, it's a, a cupboard. And I said, oh, and then I didn't think anything more of it. And then I remember him building a desk and didn't think anything more of it. And then on, on Christmas, I got the cupboard, and my brother got the desk. And I said, well, I saw you making this. And you know, they said it was from Santa. And I said, well, I saw you making this. And he said, oh, yeah, but I just threw it up to Santa in the sky. And Santa brought it for you, you know. So that's, that's the only thing I remember on one Christmas. Yeah. And again, there's the parental trying to make. Mm -hmm. Think, keep things as normal as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. The, the, the people that were in camp with you, well, of course, you had a lot of family mm -hmm. right in there. So mm -hmm. you would know. Did you have friends, other friends? That mm -hmm. you... I remember some kids from camp, uh, school. Yeah. Are there people yeah. that you ever saw after camp or once camp was done? Then... Yeah, no. Um, mm -mm. Oh. So how old were you when you got out of camp then? Well, um, we left camp before the war was over. Um, it must have been in 44. My dad um, got a notice to report for his physical um, for induction into the Army. And um, uh, I remember, uh, I don't remember him going, but I remember when he came back and they got the notice that he had passed his physical. And um, my mom, with five children, did not want to raise us in camp. She didn't want to stay in camp if my dad had to go to war. Um, because it was really hard to keep track of your children, I guess, in camp. This is what she told me. Um, kids would be running all over, and um, um, they would go to another block to eat with their friends, and their parents didn't know where they were. and. And she was really worried with five, five of us to, uh, of what would happen. And so when my dad got the notice that uh, he had passed his physical, um, they decided to leave camp, but they couldn't move back to Seattle yet because the war was still on. And my mother's brother <clears throat> um, in voluntarily, uh, in, he didn't want to go to camp, so he voluntarily moved to Spokane, which I guess they could do if they moved voluntarily from Seattle, from the west side of the Cascades, they could go to the east side of the Cascades. And so he went to Spokane, and he was working. So, um, and I remember him coming to visit every once in a while. So when my dad got his physical and he passed, my mom, they decided that we would go to Spokane. And they chose Spokane because my uncle was there. And if my dad had to go, then he, they figured he could help my mom. So um, we moved to Spokane in 44. And so I started uh, second grade or first or second grade there. Was, I came in the middle of the year, I remember. Huh. And then uh, my dad never was drafted. And I remember asking him why, and he says, well, they didn't, 
When they found out I had five kids, they didn't want to pay a lieutenant's salary to a, to a private or something. He made some kind of a joke. But my mom had written a letter also because um, they, they were told that pre-war fathers would not be drafted. And since there were four of us before we went to camp, um, you know, she wrote and asked about that. And so for some reason, he wasn't, he wasn't ever drafted. Huh. So I remember um, VJ Day. I remember my dad driving us down to downtown Spokane and all the confetti and, you know, I remember that very vividly. Wow. Mm -hmm. Did you face prejudice in, oh yeah. in Spokane? Oh, yeah, yeah. My parents put us in a Catholic school. So um, I guess because it was small enough and because of the commonality of religion, um, I didn't feel anything in school. But I remember being chased with rocks to school by kids, you know, who would call us Japs. So my brother and a boy next door and I used, the three of us used to walk to school. And there were some kids that would be waiting for us and chase us and throw rocks at us and call us Japs. And so we, I remember trying to figure out different ways to walk, you know, so that we wouldn't meet them. Yeah, I mean. Was, Spokane, I don't have good memories of Spokane. <laughs> <laughs> Even today when you go through, do you still, does that? Yeah, I just, I've been back to Spokane, but um, I just don't have good memories of Spokane at all. It's amazing to see how kids learn mm -hmm. prejudice, mm -hmm. you know, where they really don't understand what it is they're doing, mm -hmm. but there is a aggression and anger mm -hmm. behind what they're doing, you know. That's why, I, I mean, my personal view is I think that prejudice is taught, you know, I mean. Oh, I, it's, it's amazing how quickly they learn. I mean, I remember when my daughter was in, our daughter was in third grade here on Bainbridge, and the third grade teacher telling her, telling the class what they were going to learn in social studies. And she said, oh, we're going to learn about Sweden and, and what the Swedes do and, and about Norway and what the Norwegians do and about Japan and what the Japs do. And um, we had taught our daughter that Japs was not, Jap was not a good word to use. And... Um, so she raised her, oh, she, and the teacher said, and what the Japs do. And then they were lining up for recess, and she said, this boy pointed to, Lisa, to her and said, you're a Jap. And because it was a, another kid her age, she said, only stupid people say that. I'm Japanese. And I remember her coming home and telling me that. And I'm thinking how quickly kids pick things up, you know, when here were 30 other kids, 20 other kids in her class who heard that, and he just picked it up like that. But because he was her, equal, uh, her same age, she was able to talk to him. And so the next day, the teacher used the term again, and uh, this boy raised his hand and said, Lisa doesn't like to be called that. And... I just thought, you know, they learn so quickly. And I remember going up to the teacher and talking to her, and she, I knew her, and she says, oh, Eileen, we just say that. We've always said that, you know, and I, and she didn't mean anything by it, but she just, I mean, you know, kids learn. And she didn't mean anything, you know, derogatory anything by it. That's what she but, grew up with. Uh, that's what she grew up with. And I, and I explained to her that, you know, nowadays, now we don't say, use that. You know, I don't know if she ever said she, it again. She, she never said it in front of my daughter again. You know, she never said it in class again. But 
It's amazing. Huh. Yeah, to, and again, to see the progression. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is, is how a lot of times um, words like that are used without any any understanding. I mean, there are times where you know they're using them because mm -hmm. they want to get your goat on it. But there are times where it is somebody that might just be... Yeah, there's no malice or anything, know, just... That's what they, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. that's... And the challenge of society is hard to disseminate all that, mm -hmm. and understand. Right. And again, you know, your sister telling that guy, well, only stupid people use, you know, yeah. and yet... Yeah, that was my daughter who... Or your daughter, I mean, yeah. yeah to mm -hmm. to uh, diffuse the situation mm -hmm. and... and uh, but again, if, never, if she had never said that to him, he would have gone on. That's right. You know? That's right. So... Mm -hmm. Huh. So really, a lot of it is a matter of ignorance, you know? You just don't know. You haven't learned, and so... Oh, I think it's 98%, 99% ignorance. Mm -hmm. And then and then there is, there's hatred that's taught, and mm -hmm. that's separate from mm -hmm. that, but a lot of it's just mm -hmm. the ignorance. It's been interesting because interviewing a lot of the veterans, you know, again, their term of who they were fighting was Japs. And, but here are these gentlemen that are 70s and 80 years old will stop and explain, I want you to understand I use this word over here because when I went to war, that's what it was. Huh. Today, I don't use that word over here. But they've, they've compartmentalized mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah. yeah. So you then went and kind of finished growing up in Spokane, or did you then? Oh, then uh, as soon as the war was over, and we could come back. Uh, we did. We moved back in, uh, it must have been 46. Did your dad come, come back to mm -hmm. what, the fish business? Is that right? That was... Yeah, he was in wholesale fish. He was a salesman. But then um, he, when he was in Spokane, he, um, in order to get a job, um, he worked in a in a garage, and I don't know what he did. I know after work he washed cars, cabs for 50 cents to earn extra money. But um, he did something in a garage, and he picked up the auto trade. And so when he came back, um, he started his business. He started an auto rebuild business in 46. And so I wonder if that was a... Because there was still... After World War II, mm -hmm. there still was a lot of, mm -hmm. retrib not retribution, but a lot of animosity, That's I right. guess. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So I wonder if that was, do you remember if that was a challenge for him getting established in the business? or? You know, I never asked him about that, but I'm, I just assume, I, I figure it was. He had to work with a lot of insurance companies, and so I'm, you know... There were some people, I just heard about the people who were really nice to him. Um, and he, um, some people, insurance, especially insurance agents and people like that, who were really nice and kind to him. And those are the ones we heard, heard about. Yeah. He never, he never told us about the bad ones or mean ones. And isn't that, this is a real broad brushstroke, but isn't that, again, part of the Japanese culture of that, not forgiving, but looking at the positive mm -hmm. side of it. Because mm -hmm. I know when we've tried to line up interviews and stuff, and, and sometimes I'll ask a question and, I, and I'll get a funny answer. And this is a lot of the, um, a lot of the elders that mm -hmm. I talk to. Um, I get kind of a funny answer because I was asking a question to, for them to put blame on somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and they were saying, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. We don't want to look at it either way. Yeah, they tend to put, try to put the best light on things, you know, and but um, so, yeah, my dad. Plus, he was a um, a real happy kind of person, so he would always, you know. I mean, there were a lot of people he didn't like, but <laughs> <laughs> but we always heard of the really of people who did nice things or sent business his way and. Um, yeah. 
So you met Richard Wong after the camps then? Oh, yeah. 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 He was at the university and I was at CLU. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you think having the camp... I hate that. It sounds, as I said, it sounds like summer camp. <laughs> having the, 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 the mutual experience of camp, that there's, I don't know, a bond or, or, or a part of your marriage or a wife, that that's... I... For me, it is. I mean, it's a common experience, although we certainly didn't know each other. Um, it is a common experience, and we can, I can relate to his experience in camp, and I, I think he can relate to mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have your children ever asked you about? Mm -hmm. They've asked both of us about it, and when they ask, we tell them, you know, uh, and we've told them, I guess. From the time they were little, even that, uh, because we would talk about things, um, about the fact that we were in camp. Uh, so, because, huh. but they've never really asked asked me what it was like, but they've learned it too. I know um, when they had that um, exhibit at Wing Luke and they reconstructed the barracks and so forth. And our son worked on that, building that. Oh, wow. And um, I remember him saying something, so I knew that he kind of was thinking, wow, this is what they had to live in. Because that's where you look at the generation as a whole and the things, the life experiences that were faced, you know, and you always say, wow, when we were kids, we walked, you know, mm -hmm. uphill both ways. Mm -hmm. And But there were life experiences you faced that the generations, uh, my generation, um, have never, ever had our life challenged in, in that way to a certain mm -hmm. extent. I mean, I would think about your parents and you as a child and... and you know, here you are, a country that you're supposedly you're a member of. That, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden you're a no, you're you're almost a nobody mm -hmm. to a certain extent. I know we interviewed one gentleman, that, uh, Colonel Spady Koyama, and and um, Spady said, you know, I I, I um, my, the Japanese people because he was uh, interrogated. He said they didn't accept me. He said the soldiers I fought with didn't accept me, and when I went down to enlist, they didn't accept me. So mm -hmm. I was a nobody to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. My, I remember my mother talking to her about what it was asking her. And she said, well, she, they fully expected their parents to be taken, to be interned. So she said she remembers talking to uh, my, my grandma and grandpa and preparing them that um, since they couldn't be citizens, uh, they, they weren't able to be sell citizens yet, <clears throat> that um, uh, they might have to, they might be put, you know, taken away. But she said they never dreamed they would be. She said not in her wildest dreams did she ever think they would be taken. Um, so she was, they were both really surprised, I think, I mean, very horrified that they were and she talks about people coming knocking up on the knocking on the door when they knew they were going to be going and offering to buy buy the piano for five dollars or you know just people really trying to get as much as they could during those hectic days huh. but, uh, yeah it, it, yeah but my parents were fortunate because um, they were buying their home, our home, and um, were able to um, rent their home. And they happened, and they rented it to some really, really kind, nice people who um, took care of their things, you know. So they didn't have to. Um, worry about storing a lot of their things. I know a lot of our friends had to store things and lost them because the storage company had no record of their things. 
And, uh, but my parents didn't have to do that, and they were able to keep their things in the home, and these people, you know, rented the home. And I remember when we moved out to Spokane, <clears throat> um, they um, sent a lot of the furniture, the basic things like our beds, um, and a couch, I remember, um, they sent those. And she said, uh, and I remember seeing the letter that she wrote to my mom saying that she has sent these. And she said, I made three copies of the list of things I'm sending you. I gave one to the movers. I'm sending you one. And she kept one so that they won't get, and I, they won't get lost. So, um, so uh, I remember when our beds came, and I remember our couch coming. Wow. Yeah. And I remember in Spokane, when, before I started school, um, I used to speak Japanese. You know, I mean, I was very fluent in Jap Japanese. I didn't read or write, but I spoke in Japanese. And we spoke Japanese at home. And, of course, in camp, we spoke Japanese. But I remember when they, uh, we moved out of camp and I was going to start school and they sat me down on the couch. And I, re I remember this because it was so, I knew it was really important because both my mom and dad were sitting across from me. And they told me um, they were going to call me by my English name. I was no longer Yoshiko. And I was never to speak Japanese again. And I know they did that for my safety, because I used to, she said, she said, at school I used to talk to my brother and I used to explain things to him in Japanese. And so, you know, they told me I was never to speak Japanese again. And they said, we're going to speak English at home. And that, yeah. So now... All of this is not only doing what it's done, but now we're taking your heritage away from you. Yeah, well, the language part of it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I did that. I dutifully forgot my Japanese. You know, I, I don't speak any Japanese to speak of. Wow. Boy, that had to be for your mom and dad again. To go mm -hmm. again. Here you were a young, younger person hearing this, and you have a, a realization of it. But yet, for them as mm -hmm. adults to understand mm -hmm. what they're really saying. And as I grew older, and when I had my own family, I realized um, how scared she must have been to send this, you know, to school. Yeah, because when you were a child, it was just chasing you or throwing rocks at you yeah. on the way to school. Mm -hmm. But as, a, as an adult running a business, I would imagine there was probably a lot of things that, mm -hmm. you know, you never... Well, and as a parent, you know, when you, you, you're you worried about the safety of your children in school or when they're away from you, and I know that's what they were thinking about when they said that. Did, did they come back to the house in Seattle? Mm -hmm. So this family that had it, rented it, took yes, care of and it. And I remember coming back and, and moving into that house, moving back into the house. And yeah, we grew up there and we were there for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a small house, but yeah. That's the amazing thing. I mean, again, where war has a tragedy, but war also has a hero. Mm -hmm. And the hero is uh, many different ways, and here are good people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? That, that, that helped and, and stood in and didn't take advantage of the situation yeah. and, you know, quote, lost the paperwork mm -hmm. or. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Huh. They were really, really kind and. My parents never forgot them. I mean, I know when, even when we celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary, they invited them, you know, to come to the party. So it was, uh, yeah. Wow. 
W were they Caucasian? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Do you remember their name? Or? Mm -hmm. uh, Rex and Edna McAdams. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I remember when we came back, came from Spokane, um, they had two Dalmatian dogs. It's the first time I'd ever seen a Dalmatian. And I remember, and they were such good dogs. And so when we got a dog, we got a dog, Dalmatian. <laughs> wow. Huh. Gotcha. Again, as I said, the, the tragedy, but then... Mm -hmm. to have, I mean, I could see where with your parents, the bond with these people, to understand, again, more fully what they had done. Yes, and, and really when we hear of the situation of a lot of our friends, you know, and what um, they went through, they re I think my parents were just so fortunate, just in a relative term, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the yeah, yeah, huh? Yeah, because we interviewed a gentleman from over by Yakima, and they had a farm, and somebody was going to take care of it. But what they did is they just, when they left, they basically took everything, and mm. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we've heard that too. You know, there were people who just lost so much, just just lost so much. So in that sense, is yeah. Plus the, I mean, just the psychological. Oh, and the emotional. You know, breaking apart, breaking down of the family and breaking down of some traditions and heritage mm -hmm. and, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My mother um, <clears throat> went to, um, before the war, when she became a Catholic, she, they went to Marinol which is a religious order that worked in Asian communities primarily. And um, one of the reasons why they went there is the, the sisters and the priests all spoke Japanese, even though they were Caucasians. They learned the Japanese language and were able to minister to a lot of Japanese. And so that was another place where we that was a, a strong support to my parents, was the church, Marino Church. And uh, my mother said that um, when they heard we were going to be um, sent away, the Marino, the priest, Father Tibisar, went to camp to see what it was like so that he could come back. And he, she said, uh, she, he told them what it, what to kind of expect when they got there. Um, they were so afraid, you know, my parents. And she said, everybody was afraid. Um, they didn't know where they were going, what it was like, how long they were going to be gone. And so Father said he would go and, and look. And I don't know if it was built, but he was able to come back and tell them, and he, and he he tried to reassure them. He said, you know, remember that this is America. Um, it's not going to be like they had heard about the, the gas, you know, the death camps in, in Europe. And he um, said, remember that, you know, you're in America. So they probably didn't have to be afraid for their life. But, um, so he came back and he told them, what the situation was going to, kind of what it was going to be like. And he was one that warned, she's, my mom said she remembers him saying, one of the big dangers of living in a situation like this is the breakdown of the family. That when you have large masses of people, that the family unit is difficult to hold on to. So he tried to warn them about that, you know, so that was... Wow. Mm -hmm. Boy, again, you see and, these... And, you know, in, in so many Asian ethnic cultures, the family is so important. So he was trying to help them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Huh. Boy, again, you take away one piece, and what if... 
he hadn't have been there? Mm -hmm. What if, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Uh, uh, so you're, again, that goes, now your dad with the Christmas thing, you know, family, family, mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Huh. Wow. So you, again, how many years were you in, in the camp? Well, we went in 42, and uh, we left camp in 44, I think it was, it was January, early 44, so not quite two years, almost two years. Now you said your dad was a pretty happy guy to begin with, and he, it sounds like, left without an animosity. Yeah, you know, he was at a... My parents, when he, let's see, 42, he was, he was in his, um, he was 32. You know, the prime of his, prime of his life. And so I know he, um, he, he felt, he, he, he felt like he just, you know, he had to start all over when he came back. So it was like, Three years from 32, he was 32, 30, when, 35 when um, he got, when we came back to Seattle. So, you know, and he, I remember him saying, I had to start all over. But he was pretty optimistic. He was a really optimistic kind of guy, so hmm. he did it. He, how, how about mom? She was... What do you mean? What about Was her? she s similar attitude? Yeah, yeah. Because I know sometimes mm -hmm. there were people that left the camp and one was like, it happened, mm -hmm. and some hang on to it. Yeah. You know, but. No, they both were pretty, you know, um, it's, they didn't like what happened. It happened, and they had to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that old. You can't do anything about it, so you make the best you can with of it, you know. And um, I don't think they were bitter, you know. They said bitter. five kids to raise. Yeah. <laughs> they were too busy. They were too busy to be bitter. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Huh. And you're really the of the of the kids, really the only one that's probably is old enough really to remember much yeah. of the. Yeah, I, you know, I have never talked to my brother to see how much he remembers. I don't know how, what he remembers. And occasionally I've talked to my cousin to ask her, do you remember when we did this, you know, and Cap, and um, she doesn't remember, <laughs> you know. It's always interesting, too, to, to get a group together like that because... I've always said history is not a science. Mm -hmm. It's only my perception. Mm -hmm. And I could put four of you together and you'd start telling stories and you may agree and you may disagree. That's right. No, that didn't, this, right. this, you know, the cupboard, dad didn't build the cupboard that way. Dad did uh -huh. this with it. It was blue. No, it was green, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, though the, cat, uh, the cupboard that my dad, he, I don't know where he got the materials, you know, really. But I remember um, it was like masonite uh, doors that slid open, you know, sliding doors. And yeah, it's amazing. And that must have been a very special, because it sticks out in yeah. your mind. I remember bringing it to Spokane. I mean, we took it out of camp. I remember using it in Spokane and playing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't remember it coming back to Seattle, <laughs> so we may have just, it may have broken or something, and they just left it in Spokane. It, it would be interesting to have been able to hear from your dad here, where, where did you get the materials? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he probably had to go through some amazing little bartering yeah. To, yeah. to do that. Right. Huh. Or went through scrap heaps or something, you know. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.